The Epic of Gilgamesh is a poem from the Mesopotamian period. Its authorship is generally attributed to the Sumerian poet Sin Leki Unini and is believed to have been written around 4,000 years ago. During the second half of this tale, Gilgamesh is distraught over the death of Enkidu, his friend. He becomes consumed with the fear of his own mortality and a desire to attain eternal life. He embarks on a long and perilous quest to find a man named Utnapishtim, who had survived a great flood and was granted immortality by the gods. Gilgamesh hopes that he can provide him with the secret of eternal life. Utnapishtim tells Gilgamesh the story of the flood and explains that the gods granted him this boon as a reward for surviving the catastrophe. He reveals that true immortality is the exception, not the rule. Humans are meant to live meaningful lives, but eventually they die. Despite this, Utnapishtim challenges Gilgamesh to stay awake for six days and seven nights. This is a challenge that Gilgamesh fails. Utnapishtim's wife convinces her husband to offer Gilgamesh a consolation prize in the form of a plant that can renew youth. However, on his way back to the city, Gilgamesh loses the plant when a serpent steals it, preventing him from gaining his reward. The moral of this story is meant to be a simple one. Death is inevitable. We as humans have to find a way to come to terms with that reality. So that should be it, right? One ancient tale teaches us that we can't run from our own demise. The tale is learnt and the message passed on. We should seize the day and make the most of life and forget about ever trying to overcome our mortality. Yet, that isn't what has happened. In fact, history has no end of stories and tales of people trying to follow in the same footsteps that Gilgamesh once found himself in. The Spanish explorer Jean Ponce de Leon was a conquistador known for leading the first official European expedition to Florida. Whilst officially this trip was for expansionist and colonial reasons, he is often associated with the search for the Fountain of Youth. According to legend, he journeyed to Florida in the early 16th century in search of the mythical spring that was believed to restore vitality. Now, whether or not this did influence his expedition, or is merely the rumblings of myth passed down through generations, remains the source of much debate to this day. But it's the perseverance of this idea that intrigues me. Gilgamesh and Jean Ponce were not the first to tread down this path, and they certainly will not be the last. The tale of the Ten Kings from Hindu sacred texts talks about the concept of eternal life. The Chinese alchemist Ji Hon wrote extensively on immortality. And then we have the quest for the philosopher's stone and the Greek myth of Typhonus. In fact, by an ironic twist of fate, it may well have been Qin Shi Huang's quest for the elixir of life that killed him early. So obsessed was he in finding a way to overcome his mortality that it is said he drank potions laced with mercury and subsequently died of mercury poisoning. It's quite clear that this same message has to be repeated over and over again, because the fact of the matter is, most of us don't like the idea of dying. Now none of this is meant in any way, shape or form to be an attack on religious people. I'm about as libertarian as you can get and have a very live and let live attitude to life. But when you start to explore the logic, you realize none of it makes any sense. A fundamental principle in rational discourse and argumentation is the burden of proof. If someone asserts the existence of something, such as an afterlife, it's their responsibility to provide reasons or evidence to support that assertion. The line of reasoning follows that a religious type needs to prove that an afterlife exists 
because there is no evidence in our day-to-day -day life to think that it does. This is something that I've pondered for years now. Even back when I was a child, I just couldn't buy the idea of God or an afterlife. I mean, that didn't stop me from praying to God when I was a child to make the bullies go away and make my life better. But deep down, I think I knew it made no sense. It would be like a defense lawyer trying to prove that their client was innocent in a situation where they were in fact innocent. If the burden of proof were placed on the defense lawyer in a situation where there is no evidence that they committed said crime, how does one go about disproving something that doesn't exist? It is why our judicial system places the burden of proof firmly on the prosecutor. They need to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the client in question is guilty. I lacked the understanding or concepts in my younger years to adequately articulate this. I tried to make my grandmother happy, tried to be a good Christian boy, but I never believed it, not underneath. None of it made any sense. And if that's the case, then why had most humans throughout human history believed in some concept of an afterlife or another, believed in some sort of religion? The only conclusion I could come to was fear. The idea that when we die, there is simply nothing is an existential nightmare most of us can't face. My older brother, the more rebellious one of the family, had quite a candid take on the subject. He would say that religion existed for people too weak to accept that death was the end. I never liked that take. Anyone who can accept that all that awaits us is oblivion, I do not consider strong, but unfeeling. I can't imagine any rational individual not to be gripped by terror at the prospect. Now I don't want to talk about religion too much longer for this video, but I felt it necessary to bring it up because when I talk about the concept of immortality, these are often the ones who are most vocal against it. The idea that one is playing God or doing something unnatural is most often levied against me. I always found the unnatural argument a little bit strange. If you are watching this video, then it means a few things. It means that you are looking at a screen which is receiving information either being sent through miles of wiring or being beamed up into a satellite that orbits the planet before being sent back down to Earth. You are likely sitting inside some kind of structure with air conditioning or heaters, wearing objects that no other organism on Earth does, unless you count the people who dress up their dogs. We have devices in our pockets that can pull the entirety of human knowledge out of the sky. There is nothing natural about what we are. To suddenly make this, genetic engineering, the cutoff point, seems really bizarre to me. I had a conversation with a Muslim friend of mine recently. Despite our friendship, or perhaps because of it, he was able to speak his mind and vehemently oppose this concept. To him, creating immortality would be a great sin, as it prevented people the opportunity to enter into heaven. To him, I was depriving people of the ultimate gift, the passage into heaven at the end of one's life. Of course, me not believing in heaven, I can't help but think that if we continue to do nothing, then we are just as complicit in those people's deaths as if we had caused them ourselves. To switch tones ever so slightly, I want to talk about the hit show, The Good Place. If you do not wish to be spoiled, then kindly jump to the next chapter's timestamp. It is a really good show, so I would highly recommend it. But if you're still here, then I have to assume that you've already watched the show or do not care about spoilers. Right. Ready? Let's go over it. Towards the end of the show, the characters end up in the real good place. They make their way to heaven, only to find out that it's not what it's cracked up to be. 
in a state of being where happiness is eternal and your every need is met, all the residents turn into what can only be described as happiness zombies. There are no challenges, no goals to strive for, and nothing to keep them engaged. The story ends with the characters choosing to leave the good place, finding acceptance that their time is finite and that existence doesn't have to continue forever. Truth be told, if I were in their shoes, I would probably choose the same fate. Now that might sound strange for someone making an extensive video on immortality, but hear me out. When I was younger, my older brother would often say that when he died, if there was an afterlife, then he would prefer to go to hell rather than heaven. I used to just think that this was his excuse to get out of saying amen at the end of prayers. But there is some merit. He would state that in heaven, you are meant to simply be happy for existing. In hell, even if it's full of pain, you at least know that some part of you is still alive. Now, the inaccuracies of what he believes heaven to be compared to actual religious texts aside, this was a concept I just could not fathom. Why would you want to be in eternal pain? The thing is, now I get it. Feeling something, however uncomfortable or painful that might be, is better than feeling nothing at all. Life is all about variety. You need the bitter lows to appreciate the beautiful highs. I never understood people who used to cry at films. Now I bawl like a baby at loads of them because I've lived enough life to understand those feelings. I can relate to them when I never could before. It's why I just can't believe in an afterlife. Not only is there no proof of its existence, but if it truly is the paradise we are taught it to be, then I don't think that's a good thing. In fact, I would argue that a huge problem we have on this earth right now is people spending so much time thinking about the life that comes after this one that they forget about the one they already have. Why else are we not doing more to make this world a better place? Now, I know I said you needed those bitter lows, but right now there's far too many lows. We can make this place better than what it is. And that's what we should be doing. Not following books written by people hundreds of years ago and hoping that that somehow makes our life better, gives our life meaning. We find our meaning on earth, right here, right now. So now that I have firmly condemned myself to hell, let's continue on this blasphemous train, shall we? The truth is, if I was more agnostic, and someone came to me with definitive proof that heaven existed, and it was everything that I was ever told it would be, you know, eternal paradise, where there is no pain and suffering, if I had to choose between that and being on this earth indefinitely, with all its problems, all its highs and lows. I would choose this earth in a heartbeat, every time. But I don't believe there's a heaven. I don't believe there's anything. And as I said, no amount of suffering is worse than nothing at all. There was a time when people latched onto the concept of heaven because it was the only hope that humans had to avoid that endless oblivion. But we are living in the time of the greatest exponential growth in human history. The 21st century, is it the age of biological research? Are we living in our lives right now, a time when biological immortality might actually be a possibility?